All right. Uh, so that's the, the topic, as I mentioned, I'd like to cover today. Uh, four points uh, that I'd like to uh, discuss with you. So first of all, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'll share my uh, views of what a product roadmap is, and then I talk about a specific uh, format and roadmapping approach, and then try and put the product roadmap in context and uh, relate it to uh, an overarching product strategy and also the product backlog. And then finally talk a little bit about um, collaborating with others in order to uh, not only create, but also update and review a product roadmap. Um, so introduction. Oh yes, I forgot to say, <laughs> being uh, all, all excited and eager to get started. So I'll, I plan to talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then um, I'm looking forward to uh, answering any questions that you might have. So introduction. Um, I don't know how this is for you, but um, you know, we had a, a lovely summer holiday, a lovely summer vac vacation uh, this year uh, in Wales, two weeks. It was, it was really, really nice. And now as the weather here in the UK is turning autumny and um, rainy and a little bit stormy and it's getting slowly colder, I've started to think, oh, where could we go? Uh, where could we go for a, a family holiday, for a good break, for a summer holiday next year? And so hoping that travel restrictions will continue to be lifted. How about if we uh, head abroad? How about if we maybe go somewhere where it's nice and warm and sandy beaches where we can chill and relax, spend some quality time and recharge the batteries? Uh, maybe uh, a beach uh, somewhere in the south of France. And there's uh, one place um, close to the border of Spain called Agelais sur mer I must admit I've never been there, but I've heard good things about it. So it seems to have lovely beaches, uh, but also the mountains, at least the foothills are pretty close. So if you're like me and you get um, bored after a few days hanging out at the beach, you can head to the back country and maybe do some walking or running or cycling, or exploring. However, as you can see, I live uh, here in England, in the UK, in a little place called Wendover outside of London. And, uh, you know, uh, in order to get to the south of France, uh, assuming that we will, will drive, assuming that, you know, as a family, we go on a road trip. Um, there are a number of choices that I have to make. The first choice is how do we get from the UK to France? Should we take the ferry or should we take the shuttle, the train? And then should we drive via Paris or should we drive via Lyon? And then you can see it's a fairly long journey, an estimated driving time of around 14 hours. So maybe it, it's worthwhile to consider breaking up the journey and possibly booking a hotel. So, you know, these questions, I think, you know, come to mind fairly naturally. And it makes a lot of sense, certainly when you go on a road trip with a family with kids in the back of the car to, uh, you know, answer those questions and consider those questions before you set off. And in order to do that, I'd use, uh, as I've done here in this case, a product like Google Maps or maybe Apple Maps, or, or possibly even if I can find one, an old paper-based uh, map. Uh, so I'd, I'd literally consult a roadmap and I'd do some road mapping. And um, just like, you know, I would anticipate a longer journey, a car, uh, a car journey, a car trip. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it can be very helpful to use a, a roadmap in order to anticipate the journey that we want to take our products on. <clears throat> So what is a product roadmap? Well, for me, the product roadmap is a plan, an actionable plan. So a plan that can be put into action, that can be executed, that is realistic. And this plan should show how we believe that the product is likely to evolve over the coming months, uh, maybe uh, over the next six to 12 months. That might be a good time frame to consider. And you know, it often covers several major releases or product versions. So a major release uh, would be a release where we intentionally hold back, batch up some functionality and then release it at one go. Think about Windows 11 or iOS 15, I think it is now. <laughs> and so uh, often you have several of those major releases or product versions on your product roadmap. And then uh, there are different types of roadmaps. There are technology roadmaps, there are visionary roadmaps, there are product roadmaps. And when it comes to product roadmaps, there are internal and external or public ones. And so my focus uh, Today are internal product roadmaps. That's what I'd like to focus on. So product roadmaps that are used to guide the stakeholders and development teams and are not necessarily shown to anybody outside the business, outside the company. So I do think that product roadmaps generally can be useful tools, particularly for product people, for product managers and product owners, as they offer a number of benefits. What are those benefits? Well, first of all, they provide a continuity of purpose beyond the 
the next few sprints or the next major release. So, you know, if you maybe um, usually plan your development efforts, say in uh, two months or three month cycles, then having a, a plan that sort of states how the product is likely to evolve over the next, say, 12 months offers this uh, continued purpose. I think that's helpful. It's helpful for the stakeholders and it's helpful for the development teams to plan their work and see what's likely to be ahead and make the right decisions. And that brings me to the second point, a product roadmap uh, can facilitate uh, stakeholder and development team alignment um, and help people move forward together. So, you know, if we build the product roadmap the right way, then it be can become a shared strategic product plan. And that can be can be pretty powerful. Um, it can also help you communicate how you intend to implement an overarching product strategy and something I'll discuss a little bit more. So product strategy would say, what is your approach to reaching the product vision and how do you want to bring about product success? How do you want to uh, achieve product success? And equally, um, the product roadmap can help direct and unburden the product backlog. So, you know, it, it, you know, it can sort of help with the strategy, can help with the product backlog. And in fact, as I'll show you in a little while, it can help you connect those two uh, artifacts, assuming you use them. And then finally, uh, if you have to acquire a budget for your product, then that's also something the product roadmap uh, can help you with as uh, it gives you the opportunity to show the specific value that your product should create over the next six to 12 months. So, you know, a number of benefits that uh, may make it worthwhile to consider using a product roadmap. However, <laughs> I fairly regularly get asked if product roadmaps aren't anti-agile. You know, it's like some people have said to me, you know, you must be mad. You know, you can't use product roadmaps in an agile context. But is that true? So I think the answer to that question very much depends on the roadmapping approach that we choose and the type of product roadmap that we create. So here I've used a, uh, a nice looking product roadmap. Um, um, you know, it looks really nicely, it's really nicely visualized, uh, nicely done, nicely put together. However, if you look through the pieces of information uh, that you see on this plan, you know, you'll, you'll uh, realize that uh, they're virtually all essentially pieces of functionality or features like single sign-on or Facebook integration or search improvements. But what we don't really see is why those features should be created or enhanced. So what is the value of offering a single sign-on? What is the value of offering a Facebook integration to the users and to the business? So the outcome behind those features, behind those outputs, you could say, isn't clear. So this type of roadmap is very, very common. Uh, that's the traditional way how product roadmaps are approached, how product roadmaps are built. Um, and it's a feature-based product roadmap. But I think these feature-based product roadmaps, they're not particularly suitable to an agile way of working where we assume that um, we have a lot of change, we have a lot of uncertainty, um, there's a lot of risk and there might be a lot of innovation. So things might change regularly and things might change unexpectedly. And again, in that context, I find traditional feature-based roadmaps not particularly well suited. So if feature-based roadmaps are bad in an agile context, what might help then? Well, the answer uh, is goal-oriented roadmaps. Um, now, some people call them uh, outcome-based roadmaps uh, or themed or theme-based roadmaps. Some people also talk about problem-based roadmaps. To me, these terms are largely synonymous. So, you know, I, I like to talk about goals and I like to talk about goal-oriented roadmaps. So that's the, the, the term that I largely use. But yeah, if you prefer the other ones, then just mentally substitute goal-oriented roadmaps for outcome-based ones. Um, and to show you how such a product, what such a product roadmap uh, could look like and how it might work, um, you know, uh, I um, thought it might be worthwhile to look at a specific uh, structure or template. Now, this is a template that I created a few years back. If you like this template, that's great. If you don't like it, that's also great. <laughs> uh, I'm not here to try and sell you any of my templates, but just to illustrate to you, uh, as I said, how a goal-oriented roadmap works. So goals are the central hey, element uh, of Roman, a goal-oriented roadmap. Quick, quick question. Um, why, uh, what, are you, what are your reservations against feature-based roadmaps? So thanks for asking that question. Um, it'd, be, it'd be great if you give me the opportunity to finish um, my, my little presentation, and then I'm happy to take them but I'll, I'll still answer you as quickly now. Um, and so the main uh, reason is, as I, as I tried to briefly explain, 
that um, feature-based roadmaps make it difficult to uh, deal with uncertainty and change. Yeah. So that for me is a, is a major reason that you focus on, uh, you essentially map features, pieces of functionality onto a timeline. And so you then have to anticipate what specific pieces of features will be implemented and will be delivered when. Now that might give the stakeholders, it might give in case of an external public product roadmap, customers, um, a, a sense of security. But you know, if there is a significant amount of uncertainty, then that's pretty speculative. The plan is because it's pretty speculative and you might have to disappoint, either disappoint the stakeholder and customer expectations or, you know, um, things get um, very difficult for the development teams and the development teams may not be able to practice sustainable pace. That for me is really the, the main reason. There are a number of other reasons, but, you know, ultimately, it's something for you to decide and something for you to try out. Uh, I've tried uh, um, um, feature-based roadmaps in agile context. I've seen many teams and organizations do it. And so far, you know, the, um, you know, the experiences haven't been positive. At least my experiences haven't been positive with feature-based roadmaps. Hence, you know, I'm suggesting goal-oriented or outcome-based roadmaps. Yeah. So let's let's take a look at this and uh, let me try and explain what this is, how it differs from feature-based roadmaps, and then you can decide for yourself if, if that's something you'd like to try or or rather not. Yeah. So as I, as I was about to say, um, the central element of goal-oriented roadmaps is the goal. So what is the goal? Well, the goal describes the outcome that should be achieved, the specific benefit that the product should offer in a given uh, time frame, sort of in maybe uh, six weeks, two months, three months, maybe a four months time frame, or the specific problem that you want to address or even solve. And it ultimately asks the question, why is the product being developed? Why we're spending time, money, energy on progressing this product? Um, but that's not the only element, uh, even though, you know, you could say that's in a way the central and the mandatory elements, the other elements on this uh, template you could um, do without if you wanted to. Uh, I also find it useful for internal uh, product roadmaps to add a date or at least a time frame um, and to state when the goal is likely to be met. Um, the reason for that is that often uh, you have to make it a trade-off between fully meeting a goal and doing it uh, on time or within a desired time frame. I mean, ideally, of course, you'd like to deliver all the goals and meet all the goals, um, you know, according to the uh, expectations around date and time frames. But that's not always possible, right? Uh, when we deal with software products, when we deal with digital products. So again, I find it useful to state a, a date or time frame again on an internal uh, product roadmap. Um, what else is on there? Metrics. And metrics are the success criteria that help us determine what it takes to meet a goal, but then also to understand if a goal has been met or not. And I'll show you an example of a, a, a goal-oriented roadmap in a minute to make this a little bit more specific. Um, then you see there's still features here on this um, roadmap. However, you know these features are uh, limited in the sense that um, only three to five features per goal, and these features should be coarse grain. So no epics, no user stories. Um, reason for that limitation is that you don't have an overlap between your roadmap and the product backlog. The roadmap is a strategic tool, and I'll elaborate on this shortly. The product backlog is a tactical tool, and I would suggest you keep the two uh, separate, distinct. And the other um, constraint here is that every feature must serve a goal. So the goals come first, and then the features essentially describe the deliverables, the type of output that you probably have to create in order to meet the goal, just to make it a little bit more concrete for the stakeholders and development teams, what it might take to achieve a specific goal. Um, so if a stakeholder comes to you and says, I've got this uh, amazing uh, feature, which we, you must put on the product roadmap, or we must put on the product roadmap, um, and then you know, we'll all be happy ever after and rich and drink champagne in the morning or whatever. Um, then, you know, the thing you should do is to look at the roadmap and see if there's a goal that this feature supports. Now, if there's no such goal, you either introduce a, a new goal or you change an existing goal if that's, if that's worthwhile doing, if that's appropriate. And otherwise, you have to uh, decline the, the request. Yeah? So there has to be a goal for a feature to be added to the roadmap.
And finally, uh, if meeting a goal results in a new major release or product version, then you can give it a name. Think about some of those Android names uh, that used to be around like uh, Marshmallow, wasn't it Marshmallow Android version? I thought that was a, a really cool release name. So let's look at a, a sample Go Roadmap, and this is from a made up well-being product. Uh, so this is a healthy eating product that helps people eat more healthily. And I thought, uh, what could be a first good goal? And then generally the way I build goal-oriented roadmaps is that I start with uh, the goals and um, think about what would be a good first step here. This is a, a brand new product to help people eat more healthily. Well, maybe uh, it's helping the users understand their eating habits and acquiring an initial user base. So you can see this is a compound goal. Um, it consists of two parts, a user-facing part and a business-facing part. And I've uh, developed a preference over the years to uh, use those type of uh, goals on my roadmaps, but you don't necessarily have to do it the same way. You could just choose a user-facing or a business-facing uh, goal. Uh, and then the next step might be to help the users improve their eating habits and grow the user base, then help the users maybe get fitter and generate revenue through in-app purchases. And uh, the fourth goal here on this sample roadmap might be to help users meet their personal fitness targets and retain users. So I have identified goals and I've prioritized or sequenced ordered them in such a way that a meaningful progression uh, emerges and that there is a, yeah, there's a logical progression and there's a, a, in a way, a compelling narrative, you could say. Yeah. So, you know, these goals, they should really, um, they should really communicate how the product is likely to evolve, but evolve in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. So, you know, order them accordingly. And the way I've done it here is by considering essentially their semantic dependencies, what has to happen next first, what could happen next, what could happen third and so forth. Uh, and then uh, I've, I've, I've chosen some uh, timeframes here, in this case, quarters, and then I've uh, given those, um, then I've chosen some names as um, meeting those goals should result in new product versions. And you can see the first version will be the MVP, the minimum viable product. And then uh, there are some uh, features on here, uh, only two features per goal. And you can see these features are big, they're huge. They're way bigger than user stories or epics. So for instance, when you look at the uh, MVP, the first goal underneath the first goal, it just says healthy eating dashboard healthy eating dash, but it doesn't really tell us what pieces of information that'll contain. It'll just says we probably need a dashboard so people can see how their eating habits have developed. The reason that I suggest you keep it so coarse grained at this stage is that you don't solutionize and that you don't restrict the creativity and freedom of the development team or teams, because really what you want to do is you want to then iterate towards that goal on the roadmap, you know, that product goal help the users understand their eating habits and acquire an initial user base you want to iterate towards that and uh, test any ideas how to achieve it and what uh, a healthy eating dashboard should look like and what information it should contain you know through say product increments and exposing those increments to selected users and customers yeah. um, and finally there are some uh uh, metrics on there well you know there's sort of a, a, a metric stated for the for the for the for the first goal and then there are ideas for specific metrics um, uh, for the other goals which probably would have to be reworked and refined but personally I think that roadmap would probably be good enough now to start the development and start working towards the the first goal yeah. so you know that's an approach that I would uh, consider that I would suggest you consider uh, using if you feel that you might benefit from product roadmaps, so or if you currently use feature-based roadmaps and they're not working out for you, then consider using uh, goals or outcomes and start with those goals or outcomes. And then, um, you know, that, that should really be the central central uh, roadmap element that you, that you have. Now, what about the product roadmap in context? Um, so the two... Other plans that I'd like to briefly look at, uh, the first one is the product strategy. So we've already seen the product roadmap, uh, here it is. It talks about the specific outcomes the product will create in the next 12 months, and it contains goals, product goals. You could say, you could call them uh, dates or timeframes and maybe selected coarse grain features and maybe some other elements. Um, and what we'd like to achieve is we'd like to get an actionable product roadmap and a product roadmap that can be implemented and can be um, put into practice, into action, right? And in order to achieve such a product roadmap, what I would suggest is that you start by thinking about what is the strategy of my products? What is my approach to realize the overarching product vision and to make my product successful? 
And there are four key elements that I suggest you consider including in such a product strategy. The first one is what are the needs or user goals? What is the main problem that the product should solve or the main benefit it should address? It might be, for instance, reducing the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, you know, what's the market or market segment? You know, um, what's the target group? And it might be middle-aged men like myself. Um, and then what are standout features? Might be, for instance, um, uh, integration with smartwatches and smart scales or um, a, a pers personalized eating uh, recommendations uh, based on uh, latest machine learning technologies. And then business goals that might be to open up a new revenue source. Yeah. Uh, possibly to diversify the business. Yeah. So those are key elements that I would look for in a, in a product strategy. And I think it's worthwhile to consider them and it's worthwhile to answer the related questions before you start building a product roadmap um, and answer them in such a way that you're confident that you've answered them correctly. So that means that you've looked at any assumptions uh, and any risks, open risks in your product strategy and that you've uh, done the necessary work to validate those assumptions and address those risks. For instance, by interviewing users, observing users, uh, doing some uh, competitive analysis, uh, thinking about the underlying business model, thinking about uh, pricing strategy and all those good things. Yeah. And so you should have some data, some empirical evidence to show that your product strategy is valid. So based on such a validated product strategy, what I like to do is I like to uh, take the user and business goals or the needs and business goals in your strategy and then think about what would be intermediate steps to meet them. Yeah. And that then helps me discover the right goals for the product roadmap, the right product goals. And it directs the product roadmap um, and it joins up those two plans. So essentially the product roadmap then communicates how the strategy will be implemented. Yeah. So, you know, you can think of the, the needs as user goals, and then you have the business goals on the product roadmap. So I take these and I think what are intermediate steps to meeting those goals, especially for a new product or when I make bigger changes to an existing product. And that helps me then identify the right roadmap goals or the right product goals on the product roadmap. Yeah. Now, whoops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, wow. Um, this is what I wanted to do. <laughs> move to the next slide. Now, what about the product backlog? Or what about the connection between the product roadmap and the product backlog? Let's take a quick look at this. So here again, we have our product roadmap, hooray, hooray, hooray. And here is the product backlog. Now, uh, the product backlog, I would suggest, should answer the question which UX design and features are required to achieve uh, the next product goal, certainly if you um, follow the latest uh, Scrum uh, guide. Um, and so, you know, traditionally a product, uh, product backlog contains uh, uh, things like epics and user stories, maybe uh, workflow diagrams, or journeys, maybe sketches, mockups, or non-functional requirements. Now, how do we connect those two plans? So we've got the uh, product roadmap as a more strategic product plan and the product backlog as a tactical one, as I've suggested um, earlier. And so for me, it's by using the goal or the next goal on the product roadmap, the next product goal and literally copying it into the product backlog and then uh, using this uh, product goal in order to focus the product backlog. So many of the product backlogs I've seen over the years suffered from the challenge or the issue I should say that uh, they were simply too big, they simply contained too much stuff, they were unfocused, they lacked something like a product goal, something like a specific outcome that in a way um, told the scrum team told the product people, told the um, product owners which items should go into the product backlog and which ones shouldn't. So if you use a product goal, then that essentially means that only items should be in your product backlog that serve this goal. And that allows you or that encourages you to remove all the other items, which means that your product backlog um, contains not, not only the right items, but also it results in a focused, in a concise product backlog that tends to be considerably shorter than when you don't use a product goal to constrain or focus your backlog. So if you follow this model, then you essentially get a nice connection from the strategy via the product roadmap to your product backlog. So these three plans are all then joined up, they're all aligned and they should all be consistent, which I think is rather Marvelous. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> now, uh, there's one more thing that I wanted to discuss with you. Ooh, what's happening with my slide? Ooh, it's gone too fast now. Hmm, sorry about this. And that is, uh, 
Can I go back? Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit about collaboration and roadmap reviews. So it's it's all good and well uh, to build an amazing, beautiful, goal-oriented or outcome-based product roadmap. However, if uh, this is the, the roadmap of the person in charge of the product and uh, the stakeholders or development team members don't understand it or don't buy into it, it's pretty, pretty useless. Hence, uh, I'm a big fan of collaborative road mapping. Um, and that means bringing the right people together, be it in the same room or be it online. So there's the person in charge of the product in a Scrum context, that'd be the Scrum product owner. Here we have the development team members, uh, again in Scrum, uh, more recently also referred to as developers. And then we have key stakeholders. So those are stakeholders who you need in order to um, progress the product, maybe to provide it and offer it. Uh, so for commercial revenue generating product, that might be somebody from marketing, sales, support, maybe finance. So to bring those people together um, and have the Scrum Master there uh, and ask the Scrum Master to facilitate and bringing those people together and uh, creating a new uh, pro product roadmap collaboratively and then reviewing together and updating a product roadmap together has a number of benefits. The first one is you leverage or the, the, the knowledge and the expertise of those individuals is leveraged and that's very helpful because, you know, even if the Scrum product owner here is a very knowledgeable and experienced product person, you know, it's very difficult to be fully aware of um, any development issues or risks or constraints. And the same is true with the marketing sales support and finance side. So, you know, often the Scrum product owner doesn't have all the knowledge in detail and relies on the expertise of those individuals. And then by bringing people together, you create transparency. People hear their different ideas and perspectives and concerns and understand each other's, hopefully understand each other's goals and needs. And that frees the Scrum product owner from creating an initial plan and then going to the development team and then going to one stakeholder, going to the next stakeholder and trying to kind of, you know, persuade people or sell the plan or kind of broker a compromise, which usually isn't really a, a, a good foundation for a successful product. Yeah. And then I found that by um, bringing people together and asking people to contribute, you create a shared understanding. So it's clear what the plan means. And maybe most importantly, uh, you give people the opportunity to contribute, which usually results in stronger support and stronger buy-in. It makes it more likely that people actually work towards those goals and not just pay lip service and then follow their own goals. You know, so something I'd really uh, recommend, I'd really encourage, um, if you haven't done so, then maybe something to try out, no matter which product roadmap format and template you use that you try and bring the uh, key stakeholders and development team members or representatives if you work with several teams together and uh, make sure your Scrum Master facilitates, uh, maybe set some ground rules to ensure that uh, nobody dominates and everybody is heard. So what you don't want is you don't want the most senior person in this meeting making the decisions. You want to generate as much buy-in as possible, but at the same time, you want to uh, create a product roadmap that, um, moves your product forward in the right way and maximizes the chances that uh, you know, the product creates value, creates as much value as possible. And then finally, uh, a product roadmap is just a snapshot of what we know at a given point in time. And as uh, the world changes, as market change, as new competitors maybe emerge, as new trends and technologies appear, or maybe there are changes within the business, the plan goes out of date. So uh, I think it's, it's wise to regularly uh, review the product roadmap and update it. And in order to, to do so, you can look at two dimensions. You can look at how stable or mature or how old is my product and how dynamic or changeable volatile is the market it serves. And so if you have a changing product, a young product or a product um, that's being uh, updated uh, significantly and the market is very changeable, you might even want to review your product roadmap on a monthly uh, basis. But if there's more stability, then usually quarterly reviews are sufficient. If there's a lot of stability and continuity, you might even get away with six month reviews. So if you're not quite sure, uh, as a rule of thumb, I would suggest review your product roadmap every three months and review it together with the product strategy. The way I look at product strategy and product roadmap is that these two plans complement each other. They sort of form part of a package. Um, you know, if the strategy changes, you have to change the uh, roadmap. If there's significant roadmap changes, that might suggest adjustments to the strategy. So it usually makes sense to uh, review and update them together. 
Uh, so uh, those are my thoughts on Agile product roadmaps. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found uh, what, I, what I had to say a little bit useful. Um, there's more information available on product roadmaps on my website. Um, I've also uh, written a book on uh, product strategy and product roadmaps called Strategize. Uh, so some of you might find that helpful. And if you're particularly interested in uh, collaborative workshops and bringing the stakeholders and development team representatives together in uh, collaborative decision making, then uh, take a look at my latest book, How to Lead in Product Management, that uh, covers those techniques. And then I'm very much looking forward to your questions now. But if for whatever reason your question doesn't get answered, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email. So thanks again for your attention. Fantastic. There are a lot of questions here. Um, some of the early ones, I believe you have, um, you found a way to, to respond them um, later. So I'm going to start, I'm going to just pick some. Uh, one is around the OKR. So to start with, uh, with the outcome and the thinking there, the goals. Um, the question is from AJ in our organization, which is product company, we are promoting OKRs. And uh, what has been your experience on building roadmaps aligned with OKRs? So yeah, that's a nice, nice question. Um, thank you for asking it. So I'm not an OKR expert by any means. However, I did um, kind of, I experienced OKRs firsthand but by, um, when I was at the company that invented it. So I was working for Intel in the late 1990s and Intel invented, o, uh, Andy Grove at Intel in, in, in invented OKRs in the 70s. And uh, I mean, o OKRs, objectives and key results really are a goal setting method. They're a technique to set goals and they can be helpful when they're applied in the right way, but they weren't really invented for uh, product management and the way I experienced them at, at, at Intel, they were used to set objectives for uh, departments, teams, and individuals, not for products. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't apply OKRs in product management, but you know, I just be a, be a little bit careful how you do it. So you, you know, when it comes to the product roadmap, you can think of the goal or outcome as the objective, and then the other elements as the key results. So you could say, okay, the, the date or time frame is a key result. The uh, metrics, you know, again, form part of the key results and maybe the features if you use features, you know, but, you know, how should I put this? One of my, one of my issues with OKR is that I find that they lead to fairly verbose text heavy documents, um, whereas the roadmap um, template uh, format that I shared with you, you know, tries to be as visual as possible. I mean, traditionally roadmaps are uh, displayed or visualized as a table but if you now think about you know taking the information that was on the sample roadmap that i shared with you and expressing them as a set of okrs there's a lot of text uh, that you need to read through and you know i find it personally then difficult to see the connections particularly between the goals so that's just something to be in mind i mean for me personally i have to say okrs feel a little bit like a 1970s technology and you know, in, in, in particularly in the last five to 10 years, a lot of purpose uh, developed um, product management templates have, have appeared, you know, starting in a way with Alexander Osterwalder's business model canvas. And then think about the lean canvas, Ashmoria's lean canvas. Think about Osterwalder's um, value proposition canvas. Think about my product vision board or the Go product roadmap. We've created those, uh, those, those, those templates, those tools to make it easier for product people to communicate um, you know, the essential pieces of information and yeah, move away from text heavy documents. But, you know, ultimately that's of course your choice. Mm -hmm. um, I will move after to Chris Kostry, uh, Jeff, sorry, uh, and then Chris. Uh, Jeff, you have a couple of questions that I think are both interesting. Which one do you want to, to pick first? Uh, as with uh, as with everyone who uh, who has a backlog of questions, I want both of them answered. Yes, and and, and right now. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, you know what, Roman? Um, um, I, I I did have two questions in there. Uh, you started with the analogy of the uh, of the road map going from the UK down to France, um, and that road map gives you lots of options. Yet the product roadmap you showed tends to lock me, or it looked like it locked me into a specific set of features uh, by quarter. I'm just wondering how you can how you can maybe talk a little bit more about that and how the roadmap maybe should 
give me the options because Lyon and Paris aren't the only two options for me to get from the UK uh, to the south of France. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So, um, you know, when, when I think about planning um, a road trip, a car journey with my family to go on holiday, you know, we, we, we discuss options, but then we'll say, that's the road we'll take. And then, you know, if we believe that's the right route, then, you know, we book the shuttle, we book a hotel along the way if we feel we need to stay over. And so, you know, we kind of, you could say, commit to one of the options. And part of the product road mapping process is really to say, how can we now, assuming that we have this validated product strategy, and it's important for me to emphasize that the product road mapping approach that I teach and the model that I've developed, you know, starts with, um, building a product strategy and then validating, iteratively validating that strategy. And that's the input for a product roadmap. So we've already done some uh, upfront, you could say, uh, discovery, uh, including some user and market research. So we've looked at various options to ultimately achieve product success. And based on that, then we build the roadmap. And, you know, just like, you know, I would choose a specific way to travel to the south of France. I would choose a, a specific way then to implement this overarching product strategy and break the needs and the business goals into, into intermediate, more specific, measurable, tangible goals. And then so, every three months, every three months, I would uh, get together with the stakeholders and development team representatives and look at the roadmap, just like, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a road trip from time to time, you know, your sat nav system will inform you that maybe, you know, the, 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 the route choice has been adjusted because of a traffic jam or because of an accident or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, we'll do the same thing with the product roadmap every three months as a rule of thumb, we come together, we look at the roadmap, we uh, look at what's changed and then we adapt the product roadmap so that the plan stays valid. Can I sneak mm -hmm. one more question in Hardy? I, I'm sorry to, to do this, Roman. I, I'd love to just I love the analogy and I love your answer for it. Um, I'm just curious because in product development, we have a hypothesis on what we often think is going to happen 12 months from now or where we want it to go. But along the road, we find that that goal itself is wrong. And yet sure. we've built this roadmap and communicated that out. Sure. Can you sure. maybe make that connection back to your roadmap sure. earlier? And then yeah. I'll, I promise, Artie, I'll be quiet. That's all right, Jeff. But you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, the more uncertainty there is, the more change there is, the more innovation there is, you could say the harder it is to plan um, and, and create a correct plan, particularly, you know, when we're talking about a time frame of the next six to 12 months. But, you know, that's a fact, I think. But, you know, if that is a fact, we face two choices. One choice is to say we can't plan, right? We, we can't plan. And when you look at Scrum or a framework like Scrum, what Scrum does is it, it in a way takes that position. It says, all we can really do is ultimately we can formulate a longer term goal. We call that the product goal. And then really we have to inspect and adapt. And, you know, every few weeks we see, you know, how far have we come and are we, um, how we're tracking towards that overarching product goal. And, you know, it might be that we have to change course. But, you know, I think for many businesses, uh, a continued like some more continuity is desirable so that the stakeholders understand how their, say, the marketeer understands how the marketing strategy uh, may have to evolve and the sales rep understands how the sales strategy has to evolve and that the development team understands, oh, you know, those are goals that we want to achieve in the future with our product. Therefore, maybe, you know, this technology choice might, might be suboptimal and then we have to do some architecture refactoring and then actually it would incur a significant amount of time and effort, you know? So, and, and for me, having a goal-oriented outcome-based roadmap in a way is the sweet spot or, you know, I don't know if sweet spot is the right word, but it's sort of, you know, it's kind of the right answer because it doesn't really lock us in in, in, into a specific solution and says, these are, you know, pieces of functionality that must be delivered on those states, <laughs> go and do it. And then, you know, that's going to be wrong pretty quickly if it's, if there's a lot of change, uncertainty, innovation, or it results in a death march for the development team, or which is rubbish, particularly in an agile context, right, where we want to promote sustainable pace and uh, healthy work environments that don't impact people's well-being. Um, and so, yeah, for me, a goal-oriented outcome-based roadmap kind of addresses those challenges. And for me, it sits at the right level. But 
you know, ultimately it's up to you to decide what is right for you, what works for your products. And, you know, I'd encourage you to experiment, you know, and try out different approaches and see which one works best for you. Right. Next will be Chris. Chris, you had several questions, uh, but you picked one. <laughs> Maybe you can bring a little bit more context for Roman. Hi, Roman. Um, my question uh, was, um, how do you specify goals and metrics when you're building software for a very small internal user base, like five traders or a couple of financial controllers, mm -hmm. when the, there aren't so many metrics um, available? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that question, Chris. So for me, uh, again, it kind of really starts by, ans by asking the question, you know, who are the users? Um, and uh, what is their their need, their over their, their, their overarching need, you know, for this product? And so, you know, the example that I gave, I think, was um, reducing um, the risk of developing type two diabetes as a specific uh, need, and then, you know, characterizing users by using maybe some uh, demographic um, uh, qualities uh, or maybe some behavioral psychographic uh, qualities. And I think I mentioned uh, middle aged men. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit weight, but you know, I, I kind of sort of fall into that age bracket, I guess. Um, and then also think about the business goals. Think about what is the benefit of the business to develop a specific product. In your case, it seems to be a, a trading uh, uh, piece of software or app. Um, and once you figure that out, then ask yourself, okay, you know, what is now a, a first good step or the next step in order to meet those user needs and those specific business goals? And so really you break those bigger overarching goals into intermediate, more specific, hopefully measurable goals. And these measurable goals, you then um, put onto your product roadmap and sequence them in such a way that um, yeah, meaningful um, progression uh, you know, of your product is, 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 you know, is achieved. And there's, there's sort of a, a compelling narrative that is being created. So that'd be, that'd be my suggestion. So, so go back and ask yourself, do we have something like an overarching product strategy? Do we know who the users are? Do we know why they interact with the product? Do we really know this? Um, you know, do, we, do we know why the business needs this product or what the, the business benefits are? And if you, if you have these pieces of information, then hopefully that should put, good, put you in a good position to start identifying goals for, on your product roadmap. And once you've got those goals, then think about the metrics in the sense that how can you how can you tell that a specific goal has been met? Yeah. Yeah. What 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 would be a good um, what would be a good set of success criteria, or maybe what would be a good criterion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wayne, Chris, uh, I hope that answered right. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Okay, Wayne. Uh, yes, hi. Um, that, this is really interesting. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, first of all, um, just looking at the, the, the difference that you suggested here, I know the, the traditional feature-based roadmaps are what everybody thinks of when they think of roadmap, and they tend to be fairly fixed in stone, and we're following the plan instead of adapting to change. So the whole adaptability thing to me is kind of interesting. How, how do you see the goal-oriented roadmap? How, how do you change it and adapt it as, as you go? Yeah, nice question. Thanks, Wayne. So, you know, I think about two inspect and adapt cycles that um, kind of feed each other. Um, so, you know, you have the, in a way, tactical inspect and adapt cycle. Um, and if you use a framework like Scrum, you know, your sprints implement that inspect and adapt cycle. You know, we, we build a product increment, we put it in front of people, we listen to what people have to say, or we release it and collect the data. And based on the feedback that we've received, based on the data that we've received, we decide what to do next. And hopefully not, you know, understand how we can improve Proof the product, how we can uh, make it so that the user needs are met in an even better way. Then there's a second inspect and adapt cycle, and that's on the strategic plane, so to speak. And you know, it it takes place as a as a default, as a rule of thumb. Every three months, every three months, we take a look at the development progress. We take a look at uh, any bigger changes in the product backlog. We take a look at uh, any bigger changes in the marketplace. We take a look at uh, if there are any new trends. 
Uh, we take a look at the competition, if the competition's made a move, if uh, there are any new competitors, we take a look at if there are any significant changes within our business. And we use th these pieces of information to um, understand if the product strategy and the product roadmap are still valid. And if not, then we adjust those plans. And so if the product roadmap then changes, if you follow my model, if you apply my model, that, that will have an impact on the uh, product backlog. So those two cycles, they're connected and they feed each other. Um, and I think, you know, what agile, traditional agile frameworks like Scrum don't address, they don't address that strategic level, that they don't address that, that strategic planning aspect, because the focus very much is on being a, a framework that helps teams develop complex products. So it's a, it's a development focus. It's in a way you could say a tactical focus, but that doesn't mean that you uh, shouldn't think strategically and that you shouldn't do any strategic product planning. I mean, the opposite is true. If you don't have an idea, uh, at least that's my view, right? So if you don't have an idea who your users are and why people will want to use your product, how can you identify any user stories? How can you tell any user stories, right? I mean, it's purely speculative. Yeah, I know what you mean. Absolutely. Um, so, and just quickly, the other question, the, because it's such a different approach, uh, have you seen um, teams struggle with the shift in mindset, maybe from a, a traditional product roadmap? And if so, uh, have you helped, how have you helped them? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I've seen you know, a number of teams, a number of organizations struggle, but I think, you know, that's not too dissimilar to teams and organizations getting used to running sprints and, you know, having a product backlog that evolves and is dynamic and, and flexible or emergent. Um, and seeing that as not something that is a threat or difficult, but actually, you know, as being beneficial. Um, you know, for me, it's really about bringing an understanding and awareness to the, the, the product people uh, the product managers or scrum product owners because i very much see the scrum product owner or you know if you prefer the term product manager and i very i mean for me uh, a scrum product owner is an agile product manager um, without wanting sort of to open up a new a new conversation or discussion necessarily um, you know those are the people i think that that really should lead the uh, strategizing and discovery effort you know if they own if they're empowered if they own their product on behalf of the company which i think they should be i mean product people who aren't empowered will find it really hard to do a good job um so you know assuming you've got empowered product people then these are the people who need to understand um how product planning works in an agile context and how certain a certain product road mapping approach and certain product road mapping formats will, are likely to help them um, and the other thing that needs to happen is that the decision makers in the organization buy into the approach and are happy that, you know, product roadmaps don't show those detailed features mapped out 12 months in advance, where we speculate and pretend we can correctly anticipate what's going to happen in nine months, 10 months time from, from now on, but that it's okay. It's okay to agree on goals and we try and, you know, uh, yeah, agree on those goals. And then we inspect and adapt, say every every three months. And you know, if the if reality changes, you know, the, the plan has to change too. But you know, that's that's to a certain extent a, a mindset change. And again, you know, I, I I think my experience suggests that the decision makers, the leaders in the organization, have to be willing to um, embrace that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Robin. That's that's really great. We have about seven minutes left, and at least three questions. So I'm going to start with Paul. Paul, do you want to ask yourself or it's around the yeah. multiple product? Hey, so uh, question. Uh, lots of information about managing it as individual product teams. But if each individual product team has its own stakeholders and builds its roadmap, how do you collectively get product teams to align on business objectives? Yeah, thanks for asking that question, Paul. So my focus is on uh, a roadmap for, or it has been, uh, you know, in the context of this session uh, on a, a roadmap, a plan for an individual product. Now, if you have multiple products, uh, and it's always worthwhile checking, and, you know, ultimately goes back to the question of what, what is a product, uh, you know, and for me, a product is a value creating vehicle, an asset, a digital product. In the, in the case of a digital product, you know, it's a piece of software that creates value uh, largely on its own for a group of people, users, 
possibly customers and the business. So, you know, digital asset creates value on its own for a group of people and the business. Now, that's what I refer to as a, a product. Now, if you have multiple products that are part of the same portfolio, possibly of the same suite. I mean, I used Microsoft PowerPoint to share my slides with you, part of the Microsoft Office suite, uh, one of the major revenue generators, cash cows of Microsoft, as far as I know. Um, you know, the Microsoft uh, Office products are all productivity tools. They need to be aligned. And I think, you know, Microsoft does align them uh, in various ways in terms of the release cycles, but also the look and feel, the user interaction and so forth. Um, now, the way to do this is by um, creating an effective product portfolio management. And in, in the case of Microsoft Suite, I don't know how Microsoft operates, but you know, my, my approach would be to have somebody in charge of that uh, suite and possibly to agree on some strategic goals or otherwise to align the strategies and roadmaps of the individual products that are within uh, you know, that, that suite. So a, uh, a group of products that are closely related and as in, in the case of Microsoft Office are also bundled. Uh, you can only subscribe as far as I know uh, to Microsoft Office as a package, not to individual Microsoft Office products. Yeah. So it just you could say that it it's it, it adds a, a layer of complexity, but you know, it's just that we need to coordinate now several products and need to agree on on, on, on shared goals for those for those products in order to align them. But you can essentially take uh, the principles and the techniques that I've shared with you and kind of move them up another level. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate that, Roman. Cheers. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> so, Fad is next. He has a question for a non-product teams. Yeah, just to, uh, this is uh, very helpful in a product context. Uh, we're we're an adult kind of advisory team. I don't want to call us a COE. There's a whole bunch of baggage that comes with that. Uh, just agile advisory team, and we're recently starting to build a proper sort of roadmap for ourselves. Uh, we have certain goals. We're taking a similar approach to the one you've shared with the Go Roadmap. What advice or insights, just from experience and having developed and evolved this over time, would you give to a team like ours when we're looking at a non-product or more of a change transformation um, context? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I mean, you can look at the um, the change effort as, or the change as the um, the impact you, you want to create, you know, so you can still think about, you know, for, so, so for me, um, so I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in organizational change. I'm not an expert in services, but, you know, I, you know, I, I offer a number of services of revenue generating services and I very much treat them like the products that I've created and that I offer. So personally, I don't really distinguish much between them. And so in your case, I would suggest that you consider you know, again, coming up with something like an overarching strategy and asking, okay, you know, who should benefit from, you know, the, the, the changes that we'd like to uh, bring about, um, you know, what kind of need is it, do we, do we address, you know, um, and, you know, what are the business needs or the business goals? And then, you know, in order to achieve that overarching strategy, you know, what will be now specific steps that we can take, intermediate goals, and can we make them, um, so specific that they become measurable that we can tell if we've met those goals or not. Yeah. I mean, they're just not going to be product goals. They're going to be related to your change um, effort or your change project, but you should still be able to derive them. I mean, I sometimes in my workshops suggest to uh, the attendees, uh, product people, that they build a learning roadmap. And I've, I've wanted to write a blog post about this for a while. Maybe I'll get around to do it uh, next month or the months after. Well, you know, you say like, oh, you know, how can I make sure that I continue to develop and grow as a professional? Well, maybe I should set myself some learning goals. Maybe I should have something like a learning roadmap for the next, I don't know, three months, six months, 12 months, so that I, you know, have a continuity and I, you know, I, there's a path and there's a meaningful journey, a meaningful learning journey that I, that I, that I, that I enter and I can track that journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can we sneak two quick questions? Maybe you can answer quick. One is around the role of the, I think Sheila is asking one, is around a, a Scrum Master facilitating conversation with stakeholders. And um, doesn't that set up an antagonistic relationship between the product owner and Scrum Master? So that is one. And the other one is just, uh, there are sprinkles of it in different questions, but this around data-driven, and, and uh, evidence 
driven kind of uh, uh, management. I know they are different, but these two, the last questions. <laughs> Should we start with the data driven or with the Scrum Master and product owner relationships? So, you know, from, from personal experience, I find it really useful when you want to embrace collaborative decision making. And, you know, if you run a collaborative road mapping workshop, then that means that the decisions uh, are, made, are being made by the people together. So, you know, it's participatory or collaborative decision making. Now, if you attempt that and people don't really fully trust each other, don't really know each other that well, or aren't really used to um, making decisions as a group, but expect a person or the person in charge to make that decision, you know, I find you, you will benefit from having an experienced, skilled facilitator present who makes sure that everybody is listened to, everybody is heard and nobody dominates. So, you know, I don't, and, and so one of the suggestions that I made is that you may want to ask your scrum master or agile coach to be that facilitator. Now, I don't really see in, from personal experience, I don't really you know, believe that this would necessarily set up any form of confrontation or adversarial relationship, unless the scrum master and the product owner, you know, the relationship, the connection isn't particularly uh, strong and isn't really characterized by mutual trust and respect. But if that's the case, then I think it's something to recognize and something to, to work on and uh, try and resolve. I mean, my experience suggests that any uh, Scrum team really benefits from a, a healthy relationship between the product owner and the Scrum master. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I view from a product owner perspective and, you know, I specialize on the product owners and the product management side of things. So from a product owner perspective, the Scrum master is a really valuable partner. And if the relationship is damaged or if the scrum master is not available or not sufficiently qualified or if there's no scrum master at all then that has a significant impact on the work of the product owner and makes the role so much more challenging and it's already a demanding and challenging job so you know the simple answer Sheila to your question is no <laughs> mm -hmm. okay at least not in my experience thank you Roman um I don't know if the data driven, is there anything, any nugget that we can share quickly? I know we are going a little bit over time. Uh, well, you know, if you, if you kind of um, think back to what I had to offer, what I had to suggest, then I, I said that, you know, first of all, before you build a product roadmap, make sure you have a validated product strategy in place. And validated means that you've got empirical evidence or data to show that the statements in your product strategy are likely to be correct. And I've also suggested that you should then um, put some metrics onto a goal-oriented outcome-based roadmap. And the reason for that is so that you can uh, to encourage you to work with specific measurable goals and then be able to understand if you've met those goals and collect the relevant data, you know, and um, anything else, you know, you, you, you sort of, I guess, have to drop me an email and send me a follow-up question if you, <laughs> if, you if, there are more, if there are more open questions around that data piece. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it, uh, the, mess, the, the chat is going crazy. A lot of thank yous, lots of people that have enjoyed 10 out of 10. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I think you hit the mark with a lot of people here and they found this very useful. Thank you so much for your time with us. Thank you so much for your patience and, and, and going through all the questions we have. Um, I, I really appreciate this and, and very useful. We will share the recording. We will share um, all the information here. And uh, you are welcome to join us anytime in the future if you, if, if time permits. <laughs> well, that's lovely. But thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. It was uh, really nice to be with you. Thank you for your questions. I hope my answers and my thoughts were a little bit helpful. And yeah, good luck with your product plans and product planning and good luck with goal-oriented roadmaps. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, maybe, maybe you just want to give them a go and experiment with them and find out for yourself if they, they work for you or not. Great, great. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you everyone that joined today. Let's uh, hope to see you in uh, future sessions with us. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye.